Hello, I hope this video finds you in a very good mood. I am Ketki Vaidya. Welcome to yet another episode of the Personal Branding for Professionals video podcast. Now, if you're new here, as the name suggests, this podcast is for professionals and it is aimed to help them build their personal brand and go beyond their job titles when they define themselves. So if you're a professional who is interested in the journey of your self-discovery and personal growth and career growth as well, then this is the right podcast for you. But I would let you decide that by either sticking with me in this video or by watching other videos on my channel. If you do like the podcast, if you do like the episodes, please, please, please like, share and subscribe. This is something that will help me personally to spread this message to a wider audience. And I hope that you will support my work by doing so. Now, today is a very special episode. And as opposed to the formal introduction that I do, which you know, if you followed my previous episodes, I thought I would do something different this time. This episode is a very mysterious one because I don't know how I managed to get Kara Golden on my show. And she's a person who needs no introduction. She's the CEO and founder of Hint, which is best known for its award-winning Hint Water, the leading unsweetened flavored water. Uh, she's been recognized as Fortune's uh, one of the most powerful women entrepreneurs in 2011 and Forbes 40 women to watch over 40 in 2013. She's received innumerable accolades after that. She's recently launched her book Undaunted, which is already a Wall Street Journal and Amazon bestseller. With this episode, I'm organizing a giveaway. And if you watch till the end and follow the rules of the giveaway in the description below, you have a chance to win a free Kindle edition of Kara's book Undaunted. So this episode is dedicated to overcoming your fears, facing your doubters, and being undaunted in the true sense. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. Let's begin. Hey, Kara. I've been dancing around all day waiting for this very moment. I still cannot believe that you're on my show. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Very, very excited to be here. Now, I have to say, Kara, that you are everyone's favorite entrepreneur. There's no doubt about it. But I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for being such a wonderful human being. And uh, the wonderful goodies that you sent, the case of Hint Water that I received, it was such a thoughtful gesture. In a way, I look at that as my reward of being undaunted because I faced a lot of fears, overcame them to start this podcast. And this right here, you being on my show, is the biggest success of my podcast. So welcome again. <laughs> Well, very, very excited to be here. And, you know, more than anything, I think podcasting certainly has taken off during the globally during the pandemic, but it's a, it's a time when even the very smartest, very accomplished people, you all, <laughs> I, there's always something to learn in podcasting, right? I'm sure Absolutely. everything from figuring it out you know, not only the research and the questions, but also, you know, which microphone is the best one <laughs> or all, all of these pieces along the way. So I have my own podcast. So I know this firsthand that it's, it's, uh, it's, it's sort of the puzzle that entrepreneurs and executives thrive on uh, that Absolutely. is, you know, Absolutely. learning right which is yeah. it's also new so it's very exciting yeah and when you look at podcasts I think it's the little upgrades that you make so when I started my show I didn't have a webcam I didn't have a mic and then with the eventual success I got a green screen and I got a I got the best microphone got the webcam and that's how you upgrade with the podcast but there's always something new there's always something mysterious about it and even though it looks really seamless on the surface uh, it has a lot of work in the background I love it. Yeah, no, I totally, <laughs> totally agree. All right. So Kara, we want to start with your glorious journey. Now, when I look at the world around me, I look at people in the corporate setting, they usually associate the zenith of their career with being in a senior, senior leadership position. And you were already a vice president at AOL at the time. So what motivated you to uh, leave that and start your own company? So it's an excellent question and one that I wouldn't have been able to answer actually when I was leaving AOL. I mean, mm -hmm. sort of the, I, I think where my head was, was that I had, uh, I had two children. I had a third on the way 
Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to take time. I didn't want to be on an airplane and all of the <laughs> United Airlines pilots knew my name. I mean, all of those things were, were part of the decision for sure. But I think what it really boiled down to is, was here I was sitting, I was mm -hmm. one of the youngest vice presidents at AOL. I was one of the few women in that position, that right. high level right. position. And I really felt like I wasn't totally satisfied. I was doing a lot of managing hmm. and mentoring, but I wasn't learning myself. And in the early days when I joined AOL, I was part of the acquisition. I was part of a little known, actually Steve Jobs idea that started inside of Apple called mm -hmm. To Market. And uh, we were acquired by America Online. And so oh. at the time, America Online was not number one. Um, mm. Sorry, Steve Case. Uh, you were they were like number three, probably against CompuServe or Prodigy, mm -hmm. and uh, there was Microsoft and lots of other players out there. And when I joined, I was I was just learning every day, and I was I was uh, you know building the puzzle, building you know the map as I was going along, and I loved it. And because I was good at it. Then I was asked to go and manage other people. Soon there's 200 people that, that are, are under my wing and that I'm teaching and watching and managing. Mm. And I think that the key thing about managing and mentoring is it's terrific. But if you're leading and you're not actually learning on your own, then it gets, it, it, you, you get bored. You get yeah. a little angry, right? Because I think that as humans, we all need to be learning. And yet, to your point, you're absolutely right that yeah. the Mecca is really <laughs> getting to this level of this higher level. You join a company and then you become a manager or director, VP, C-suite, CEO. Yeah. But the most unhappy people that I know today have missed the step of making sure that they're learning along the way. And I think when I decided to jump off the train and mm -hmm. go and try something new. First of all, I was passionate and I loved my family and I wanted to watch my kids and I knew that I couldn't reverse time. I wanted to make sure that I was spending time with them and going to mommy and me classes and all the <laughs> things that I sort of desired, right? Yeah. And But then also as time went on, I knew I really wanted to be back in business. And when I saw this opportunity, this hole in my own health, mm. and I figured out a way to solve it by getting rid of my diet soda, that's when my curiosity that was always there in business and mm. my, my ability to ask questions and try kicked into gear. When I first started Hint Water, I had many of my friends were, were in tech still, and they said, wait, what is the tech angle? And I said, <laughs> there's no angle. I mean, I'm just starting a whole new, and, and many of them, I think thought that I had lost my mind, right? They said, yeah, I you think at company? that position, anyone would, if you're leaving the company at that position, uh, that's the general consensus, right? People wouldn't get right. And, and for me, it was, it was this place where I was learning and, and learning also meant frustrated, but I also felt like I could help this industry and help consumers to really understand. And I saw so clearly this world of healthy perception hmm. versus healthy reality on the shelf. And for me, it was these things calling themselves diet uh, or labeled as diet. But there was also items that were called water that weren't the definition of water at all. If you were in grammar school and you took a test and what is water, I mean, certainly it wouldn't say, oh, it has vitamins, it has sugar, it, right? I mean, you would fail if you were a student <laughs> looking at this. So I kept yeah. saying, how did, how did that happen? Right. How did we get these products that are filled with things but more importantly, how has, how has the consumer been tricked when it's something so important as health? 
And so when I had given up diet story, uh, diet Coke, just to back up on my story, it was, it, it, it was, you know, so clear to me that I had been fooled for so many years. And so mm -hmm. when I dropped drinking diet soda, I, in two and a half weeks, I lost over 20 pounds and it was, I was like, wait, what just happened? I went back in my little log to figure out, did I do anything else? Was I working out more? What was <laughs> yeah. I eating? Yeah. I mean, all of these things. And it was shocking to me. And that's why I really sort of, as Steve Jobs used to say, the dots eventually connect. For me, mm -hmm. I started thinking back on when I started drinking diet soda. It was when I was a little girl, uh, 13 or 14 years old. I probably didn't think I was a little girl at the time, but it was my mom was drank another diet drink called tab. And of course, I wasn't going to drink what my mom drank. I mean, <laughs> of course not. And so diet Coke for me, I don't think I even liked it the first time that I drank it, but I got used to it. Mm -hmm. And I got used to the, and I thought if if this is better for me than regular soda, then I'm going to continue drinking it. And I grew up in a very hot climate in Arizona and Scottsdale, mm -hmm. Arizona, where I should have been drinking a lot more water. And I wasn't because I substituted that my water, water yeah. for Diet Coke. And, and again, I thought if somebody would have told me years ago that this is not helping me to be as healthy as I wanted to be, then I would have stopped. But instead, over the years, I was told that or shown that, you know, influencers, and we didn't call them influencers back then, but celebrities were drinking it and everything was great. I never once questioned that drink. And so for me, I really started thinking about, again, the consumer and how many other people are like me out there, whether it's drinking diet soda or watching calories, maybe it actually is certain ingredients that are causing insulin resistance and some of the other health issues that are out there that are really the problem. And I thought if I can actually get people to enjoy water or a product like Hint, hmm. then that to me feeds my soul, right? That that could actually change people's health for the better. It could change their entire their entire family, right? If the right. the, the entire the, right? lifestyle, yeah, everything about it. And I just thought that would be that is so motivating on so many levels. So in, uh, again, like I still had friends who were saying, "So when are you going to get back into tech?" <laughs> and I'm like, "Me, I don't know when this doesn't work." And then again. It didn't happen overnight. Another Obviously. reason why I wanted to get my story out there was that there were many days that were really hard and really lonely. And, and what I talk about, you know, being, being a, an entrepreneur, it's, there aren't very many overnight successes. There are many Another days day. yeah. that are dark, that are very lonely, that you're the only one that understands that, you know, my friends in Silicon Valley who are, you know, watching their uh, watching their equity turn into lots and lots of money. I'm worried because I'm getting kicked out of a retailer for, um, you know, because the big soda companies are deciding that they want to, you know, get into my space. All of these things are so real. And mm. more than anything, it, it's, it, I wanted to write about it too, because I felt that it, it's not, just about the beverage industry. You'll gain a lot of experience and, and knowledge from, from my book if you're in the food or beverage industry, but it's really, it, it's really about overcoming challenges, overcoming yeah. your own fears, doing something that you're interested in that you want to learn from, uh, that I wanted to get the message out. And, and uh, I'm so excited that we met through, through the book. Absolutely. And, and you're so right in saying that there's a healthy perception and then there's the healthy reality because a lot of us out there are lulled into a false sense of uh, having these healthy drinks, but we don't realize that uh, we are harming our own health. And 
no one questions that we just look at the marketing that's done and we just implicitly trust that brand so it's really good to have brands like yours uh, which are actually uh, justifying that trust which the customers have and i really hope that you get hint to india soon so i can have my case every day <laughs> Me too. We've had uh I have to say if there's one thing that has uh really good that has come out of the pandemic, it's mm -hmm. that uh and especially through talking more and more on my book tour, I've noticed that the world really values health, right? And Definitely. and wants to get healthy and there were many people prior to the pandemic that didn't actually think about health uh, at all ages that they just thought oh it you know i'm healthy that's someone else's problem they must be doing something wrong but we all saw that there were people who perished people who got sick who appeared healthy that appeared to be doing all the right things and we're still not sure exactly why but i think more than anything what people recognize worldwide is that you have to do what you can to stay healthy and you it starts with what you put inside your body and products that you buy question exactly yeah. the full circle i mean exactly where these things are coming from uh what are the ingredients if you don't understand them all of those things i think are absolutely critical so I would love to get into more and more countries hopefully soon. Yeah, I I hope that when when we go to the shelves of the supermarkets in India we would see him dominating all of that. And and your journey has been amazing. You you already conquered the tech industry and now you have conquered the food and beverage industry. So it's it's really amazing to look at that. And now I want to ask you the secret of what it takes to turn a dream into reality. I know that there's no secret, but what are the strategies uh, that if you have a dream of your own what would you do to turn it into a reality i think more than anything you just have to continue testing it having a dream i think is terrific and important and as mm -hmm. i always um i i'm a very visual person and so i always think about it as have that dream have that goal and put it on the top shelf where you can see it but it's very difficult to reach and so mm -hmm. i and so instead try and figure out those steps along the way while you can't reach it and and understand that all of those small steps will add up along the way to allow you to one day be able to reach your goal but you know again when you think about all of the all of the things i mean in in my business the manufacturing i mean it it's never done it's it is a constant puzzle right and as i say to entrepreneurs they're like oh but you're so big now i mean <laughs> you know you have 200 people in the company you've you know you have a direct to consumer business that is quite large as well as a regular retail business and but all of those things were steps along the way mm -hmm. and even with our manufacturing i mean something that we had done that i didn't talk about in the book because um it you know, didn't seem frankly as as important as it became during the pandemic is automation. Mm -hmm. yeah. We had, you know, we have always had incredible, um, you know, thoughts about uh, about how to continue to better our automation and our plants. I mean, you hear about so many plants, especially during the pandemic, food yeah. manufacturers in particular, that when the pandemic hit and they had to rely on people to actually be on the line for whether it's a you know chicken or in in our case in beverage that was absolutely critical because as people were getting sick during the pandemic you had to shut down the plants you had to you know do a lot of things in order to prepare for that now for the last 4 years we actually worked really hard to automate our plants so that in the final stage when we were actually filling the bottles that no bacteria could get into our product. And mm. while, when I asked the beverage industry, um, what do they do? I would, over the years, run into people. They'd say, well, we use preservatives in our product. We use a lot of things to you know, avoid that. But if you have an unpreserved product as we do, and you're just using heat, that's probably not enough. So we started really thinking 
really common sense about that last, the last mile, right? That last yeah. spot. And we thought, what if someone sneezes when the bottle is being filled? Yeah. They may not be sick, but there's still bacteria that would get in there. And that that's not going to be great for a product that ultimately would go bad from that. So mm. we had been working, working, working to remove everybody from that final stage. And, and we did it right at the end of 2019, right before the pandemic hit. So I didn't know exactly why we were doing it other than the fact that we thought it's better. Yeah. But when the pandemic hit and people were getting sick and we didn't need those people because we had automated a very critical part of our line, a company called Costco reached out to us and said, we understand that you guys are automating a lot of your lines. How did you know how to do that? And we <laughs> said, I don't know. I mean, it. we came from the tech industry. We didn't come from the <laughs> beverage industry. And, yeah. uh, and, you know, a lot of people, I've talked about this on a few different interviews and people have said, did you fire people? No, we re we were growing. And so we reallocated those people to different sections of the line that were towards the beginning of the line before the pasteurization process. But we, and we were scaling. So we needed people in order to work more shifts and all of these kinds of things. So it's not about eliminating jobs and eliminating mm. people. It's just about getting better and, and safer. And I think that that is what coming from one industry into another industry and thinking differently and not having all the answers. And all of those things are, are just so critical that I see, it, you know, even during a pandemic and even during times still to this day that, that are challenging and you don't have all the answers, but you just go out and try and, and really trust your gut as well. Yeah, I, I love the fact about trusting your gut feeling because a lot of times we don't understand why we are doing certain things, but there's just an intuition that tells us to do so. And in a way, your company was already prepared for the pandemic before it hit. So I think during the pandemic, everyone has had this reality check where they've understood the, the level of their systems, where they've questioned the efficacy of their entire production line. And now they'll be more mindful going forward because we can never anticipate what tomorrow is going to look like. But everyone has to be prepared for that as much as they can from their side. So that is something that pandemic has taught everyone out there. Everyone, right? <laughs> I, it's absolutely true. Yeah, I, I think in our own ways of impact that it has had, pan pandemic has impacted everyone directly or indirectly. And this is the realization that comes out of it. So during your answer, you said one great thing about not having all the answers. And I think that that's a scenario that we all, all the time, most of us, we we are in that scenario where we don't have all the answers, where we don't have it all figured out. And it's a really daunting place to be in. Uh, so how, how would you suggest that we get over that, those fears of not having it all figured out and still find answers and keep making progress? I think recognizing that even when you think you have all the answers and everything yeah. is perfect, that you will find out that you don't. And so my purpose in, in mentioning that, I mean, there were so many things that, I mean, we really thought early on that we had it all figured out. I had a water product that was clear and I wanted the consumer to be able to see through the bottle. And, and so we had clear labels and, you know, we had no knowledge of whether or not the consumer would be able to, first of all, we didn't know what our space would be on the shelf in yeah. inside of our local supermarket. We were at the mercy. We were a brand new brand, not only a, a not only a brand new brand, but a person that has, you know, no relationships. I didn't come from the big soda company. So I was just a lady, a consumer walking in, trying to get a bottle on the shelf. I was going to take whatever I could get. And so even, I, you know, people have said, but if you would have known where you would have been on the shelf, I, it, it's impossible. I wouldn't have known exactly where I would have been. It would have just depended in, mm. and also who I was by. If I was by a very colorful label, 
Um, you know, when you see a clear label, we just didn't stand out. So I was, mm. you know, really at the mercy of, of the retailer and the lighting in the store and how it hit the product. <laughs> and, yeah. and again, the yeah. consumer might have said, oh, it looks beautiful. Everybody thought the product looked beautiful. And, and then when it actually got on the shelf, when I went in the store and started watching what consumers did, that's when I realized that they couldn't see it. And it just, it just faded into the background. And, you know, going back to, again, one of my favorite uh, uh, entrepreneurs of all time, Steve Jobs, I mean, he used to say, you know, don't ask people what they want, instead, tell them what they want. And so no one would have said, we should not do a clear label, because they everybody said that the label was beautiful, that they loved the idea of having a clear product and a clear label. And it was so clear to me when we got it on the shelf that we had a problem. And again, we had thousands of labels that had mm. been printed and mm. they weren't cheap to print them either. They were more expensive than the regular labels. So mm. uh, for us making that shift and making that change was really difficult. And because we thought, well, we can't change because we've now told the consumer. The, the reality is, is that the consumer doesn't know everything that you know, right? They're pretty forgiving as long as they can see the product better and it yeah. ends up, you know, tasting the same, all of all of these things. So you make the changes. And especially when it's a new product, this is the time when you can go and make changes. Make the, change, yeah. the tech industry is famous for this. I mean, they they don't say, we're making a change. They just say, oh, it's an upgrade, <laughs> right? I mean, I, yeah. I always say to people, you know, pick on Apple, I mean, the iPhone, I said, there are two iterations sitting in a safe inside of Apple headquarters right now, and they're watching the consumer and exactly seeing how they, how they relate to the product, things mm. that they're asking for, but mm. they're also seeing what they do. And I think that that's such an important piece for people to remember, even the big guys, they may think that make you think that they have it all figured out and they put a lot of marketing into this is the the next generation all of these things they are thinking about the next generation and the generation after that right absolutely and i think this is so important we we often are so scared to just seek help and ask questions and you've mentioned that in the book uh, where you've mentioned all the strategies about seeking these answers, talking to people and just getting those answers and trusting yourself and just taking that step rather than sitting there and procrastinating, thinking that either being complacent that you have it all figured out or being so scared that you cannot make any progress. So it's, it's towards the middle of that spectrum where we have to start uh, asking for help, realizing that we need that help and then going forward from there. Yeah. And also, I think another really important point is asking for help, asking yeah. people what their thoughts are. It, it doesn't mean that you have to do exactly what they do, mm -hmm. right? Or what they say to do. And yeah. I think that what I realized along the way is that I would try and ask people who had more experience than I did, but then whatever their journey had been, maybe they had been Maybe I was mesmerized by their resume that they had worked in, you know, either a Coke or Pepsi or Procter and Gamble or, you know, Unilever, some big uh, company that they must know, right? They have <laughs> run products. They know how to do this, this thing. But hmm. so often if they weren't on the innovation team, if they yeah. uh, hadn't done um, something at scale, I think the one advantage I had was remembering my father and how when he was, you know, I talk about him in the book as kind of a frustrated yeah. entrepreneur that he would talk to me. And I don't think he even knew I was listening most of the time, but he would talk to me about his frustrations about, mm. you know, working inside of a large company. And, you know, he was a little bit of a misfit, I think, inside of a large company because he, he would, it, they would go as, as a company, they would pay millions of dollars to these retailers in order to get the shelf space. Many people have heard about, you know, a lot of the products that we see when we go into the grocery store, mm -hmm. it's a real estate deal, right? 
that they're yeah. negotiating real yeah. estate deals to get on the shelf. Well, that was the same experience that my father had that he didn't have to actually go and meet with buyers inside of these, inside of these retailers, the, somebody at his company did that for him. And then he was told that he would get a small place in, in the frozen food section. And so, you know, he would look at his, uh, colleague that was down the hall and he had more space. That was the fight that he was fighting with. Why do you get more space? Because we sell, you know, dollars per square foot. So I started thinking mm. about all of those things that my father told me about that he experienced inside of a large company. And we actually used a lot of those uh, strategies to actually go and compete. So when we were hearing that, you know, there were, there was a planogram and an unsweetened flavored water wasn't in the planogram. Mm -hmm. And I, I would say, so you have diet soda in the planogram, hmm. but is it possible that the dollars sold per square foot in the store are going down? Yes, because more and more people are uh, shifting away from diet soda or regular yeah. soda, then, then why isn't, why aren't you looking at a category where I only have this much space, but my dollar sold per square foot are this much. Right. And so that way I said, just give me some of that sliver. So if you're able to really understand the other side of the table, Correct. The Correct. what what they think about, mm. then you can rationalize how how to compete and how to argue uh, to get the space that we that we needed ultimately. And and this reminds me of the statement that your father said, where he said, "You turn every no to maybe and every maybe to yes." <laughs> So I think it's yes. that quality which has helped you see through your own bias, see through all the struggles and still find a solution. Uh, so yes. you were always meant to be an entrepreneur maybe, but you were accidentally uh, a VP at AOL at the time. And I'm glad that you transitioned to this industry. <laughs> well, it's funny because as a kid, uh, you know, people would say you're very... Uh, uh, you're you're a lawyer in the making i mean that there weren't <laughs> entrepreneurs it wasn't it, it wasn't a popular term to be yeah. an entrepreneur yeah. it was just you know there's something kind of wrong with you you're not able to go you're not able to get a job in a large company if you're an entrepreneur i mean that was sort of the thinking it was embarrassing you know to be an <laughs> entrepreneur and i and i think over time maybe that's you know, I rode that wave. I worked for entrepreneurs. And I, mm. I also think working in different industries where I didn't intend to work for disruptors, but working for CNN in the early days when Ted Turner was still running around the office, I, there were a lot of people, including me, depending on the day, who thought he was a little crazy. And, you know, he was very inspiring but he kept putting stakes in the ground around the world needs 24 hour news. Now you have to understand that not everybody believed that we needed 24 hour news. There were some people that said, I get home by six o'clock at night or 10 o'clock, I'm still awake and I like my news then. But there were many other people, including me, who wasn't home by six o'clock. I wanted yeah. to go for a run. I, it was usually in bed before 10 o'clock or it was out. So I never saw the news and the idea of a 24 hour news channel that had a feed all over the world. I happened to be at CNN when the Gulf war came around and that, that is what put CNN on the map. When the head of Iraq actually called the president and said, my country is being bombed. I'm watching CNN right now. And that was the day, that mm -hmm. was the moment that, that he knew that he was about to go into a hockey stick, right? That it was the, the, the world believed. Yeah. Even the people who didn't believe Tied suddenly believed, yeah. right? And so it's always... It's all, you have many little moments along the way where things 
uh, start, you know, you get, you have wins and losses along the way, but it's these main moments along the way that are, that are critical to, to scaling. And I think, you know, what being able to be a part of an organization and I was very, very low. I didn't work directly for Ted or anything. I mean, I was very low, but watching that, Hmm. it made me understand that people think you're crazy until they get it right. They think you're, there's something that they don't really understand until they do. And I think that that's a really, really critical thing for entrepreneurs to recognize. But in the meantime, keeping your chin up and keeping your head in the game and keeping enough, you know, keeping your employees uh, believing um, until it's, until you get that critical mass, having enough money uh, to be able to pay people as you're building your company, all of those things are really critical. Yeah, I think uh, your your journey with with Hint really replicates the the same Ted Turner journey that you just described. Because in a way, when you started with your unsweetened water, the Coca Cola executive was was very rude to you. And instead of being scared about the huge wave that was in front of you, you took it in in a very positive way, and that pushed you to become who you are today. So it's a, it's all these revelations along the way that definitely. Uh, when we think and when we look back, they make sense, but at the time, they don't sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> so true. So true. <laughs> right. So in, in a world where everyone today talks about finding themselves, I've talked to a lot of people on my podcast and every time this comes up, find yourself, find yourself. So in, in this world, how would you say that we truly embrace our strengths and overcome our imposter syndrome? Because half of the times we are in front of our successes, we are in front of our small wins, but things still don't make sense and we still feel like a fraud. So how would you, how would we overcome that? Yeah, I think I always think about what, what do you really enjoy doing? And I, I have the luxury of having four beautiful children who are growing up and frankly, trying to figure it all out for themselves. And I think that, you know, what I've encouraged my own children, uh, three are in university now, one is still in high school. And, and it's uh, what I've encouraged them to do is start somewhere, start figuring out what you enjoy doing and, and then try and figure out if there's something there that you can do in order to make money in order to uh, you know, get yourself excited to wake up every single day, because I think that there are plenty of jobs out there. Um, as you know, you can go and do a job for many, many years. And I, but I also think that, you know, mental health is a, is a real thing. And mm-hmm. we talk about burnout and imposter syndrome and, you Definitely. know, and unhappiness. And I mean, I think that there's, there's just many clues over the years that when we weren't sort of embracing those things, that it's not the answer. And I think millennials, I think have really done a terrific job of calling attention to this for even Gen Xers like me. And hopefully Gen Z will even expand on that even further, but there's so many different roles that you can do that, that you really can find your passion and and I think it, it, to me, passion really means it starts with what do you enjoy doing? So maybe that's, uh, maybe that is in, in the case of one of my kids, he loves cars. He's mm-hmm. redone three BMWs. He has a terrible problem with selling his BMWs after he fixes them. Uh, so he buys them on eBay and then he, uh, he restores them. Wow. And very complicated <laughs> restoring. And I have too many cars in my driveway. So this is yeah. this is our only fight is that I said, I don't have a problem with you buying these cars, but when you're off at university and I have too many cars in my driveway, <laughs> it's annoying. And I said, so just sell the cars and then just buy another one. And he doesn't listen though. But uh, but I said to him, you know, I think you are an engineer. I think you love engineering and he, and unfortunately his perception of engineering in Silicon Valley is tech. And because he's hit, that's his journey. He's grown up around a lot of 
people uh, talking about engineers. And I said, not necessarily. There's also Tesla. There's you work on BMWs. They have engineers that work on there's a lot of electronics in the system. There's also engineering around product design. There's a lot of different types of engineers. And I said, you have a gift and you have a passion at age 19 to be able to figure out something that you enjoy every day. And why don't you go and do something like that? If you could go and, you know, work at BMW, that's his dream. I said, why don't you try and take those steps to go and figure that out? How do you go and do it? What are the jobs at that company? And Mm. then go figure out how you're going to get there. All of those things. And I think are, are critical um, to ultimately to happiness. But in addition, I've also said to him, you're, you might go down that path and then you might decide that that's not actually what you want to do, that you really want it as a hobby and you want to work on that on the weekends and you have (laughs) a lot of knowledge. So that will never go away. But that's the thing is in the process, you'll learn a lot about yourself. You'll learn a lot about an industry And it'll never be a waste of time because you're learning. And I, that's the biggest takeaway that I want people to know is that, you know, it's just fine, start somewhere, find that thing that you think you're interested in today and also know that you can change. Uh, And versus when my father was younger, you know, he thought I have to do this for the rest of my life. And I mean, can you imagine the, the anxiety that you experience in graduating from university when, you know, my father would have been in his early nineties, right? right? That, that yeah. those were the time when you picked one job That's for your it. whole life. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Right. And if you quit or you were fired, then done. you maybe you could get one more job, but that was it. And you waited for your pension. You waited for, you know, this, this was what your world was all about. And the stress of that is, I mean, today it's like, well, maybe I'll go try this. Maybe I'll be here for two years. It's, you know, it's just, it, it really is a different world. And I think in many ways, one where there's a lot more opportunities and options for people. Yeah. I think if we look at a decade back, that was the narrative, just, just having a very linear career progression, but now there are so many interdisciplinary fields out there. We can experiment we are in, a, in an age where we can really experiment in this digital age. We can experiment with our jobs. We can experiment with the new jobs that are created. Just a few days ago, I interviewed a person and that person was a storyteller at Google. Now, I did not know the jobs like that existed in tech, especially when you look at tech, uh, you, you think about senior software engineer and VP and all of this. And there's a position called a storyteller, which I think it's a very creative profession. Many of us out there would enjoy doing that for a living right so well it's it's funny that you mentioned that because my daughter is majoring in storytelling wow and, yeah so she's uh, she's at brown and she's mm-hmm. majoring in storytelling and she's uh and i've talked to many i have a very good friend of mine one of our investors uh was one of the first employees at at linkedin and she has her phd in analytics and oh. Uh, from Stanford and and she was always a great storyteller and she was always the person that people would bring into the room mm. to speak about the story of the analytics and try and being able to weave that is a critical function now right for yeah. people to be able to what does the data say and what does it and and be able to storytell around that so there are there are so many different opportunities today and and I think it it's not linear at all, not and, at all. <laughs> right? You have to, uh, and but you have to enjoy what you're doing. And I think is the most important thing. And then try and figure out is, is what you enjoy? Can you figure out how to weave it into something that you're able to make money doing and that <laughs> you're able to do every day? That's the key. Yeah. And I think especially when we fail, uh, we see that failure as, as just being a dead end. But as you rightly mm-hmm. said, we learn a lot about ourselves along the way. So even if we try an experiment and it completely fails, even if we try a job that we are not good at, we, we come out of that with some sort of an experience and understanding of what we want. And that, that yeah. brings more clarity. 
And I think that the most important thing about what you said there is so often you're embarrassed, right? About yeah. maybe you've had a failure, or maybe you've had a challenge. I think that I interview many people, have interviewed many people over the mm. years. And I think that it's the people that try and brush those times under the rug versus actually the people that own those experiences. And what was the good that I got out of that experience? What did I learn about myself that I, maybe you didn't like sitting at a desk every day. Maybe you didn't love uh, having to deal with payroll every single day as a CEO <laughs> of, a, of a company, whatever it, that is. Mm. I think that you, the, the people that can actually take those experiences and then own those experiences if they didn't necessarily go the way that they went. Like it wasn't all that, it wasn't all bad. Here is what I brought out of it. And, and again, I mean, I, I think that those being able to do that has a place even in business. I mean, I talk about my Starbucks experience and, and in the book and, yeah. and, um, you know, I, I, that was a moment where I was quite upset with them. And I was quite upset with myself because I had put all my eggs in the Starbucks basket. But yeah, I also appreciated the fact that they paid me for product on time that I ahead of schedule that they exposed my product to thousands of doors nationwide. And so I, I, I think being able to look at the good and no matter what experience you have, Mm. Um, and learn from those experiences to do better the next time are also so critical. So yeah, I hopefully everybody will get a chance to to listen to the book on Audible or read the book. It's available worldwide. And uh, and I uh, I would love to hear from you as well if you get a chance to read it. Yeah, I, I read the complete book and I'm going to email you what I thought about it because there are just so many strategies out there which I think I really needed at this point of my life I needed to hear this I was already experimenting with this podcast so I needed to hear a lot of what was said in the book and and the best thing for our viewers is that uh, we with this episode we are organizing a giveaway where one of them gets this book <laughs> I have it Wonderful. right here <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So one of them gets the Kindle edition of this book. And that's because I have an international audience now. It's not just Indian. I have a very, very fun round for you. And this is the first time that I'm doing this on my podcast uh, because this episode is so special to me. Uh, so I'm going to have a rapid fire and you have to answer um, in one line, uh, whatever comes to your one mind. One line. Okay. <laughs> one line, one word, whatever it is. Okay. So uh, starting now, what is your favorite hint water flavor? Cherry. Okay, your favorite entrepreneur. I know the answer already. <laughs> uh, Steve Jobs. Yeah, you said that during your answers. Your favorite movie? Meatballs. Meatballs. Okay, I love that. Uh, your role model? Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Okay. And your favorite book? This is a big one, actually. I'm interviewing him on my podcast in just a couple of minutes, actually. Hot wow. Seat. Jeff, Jeff Immelt. Uh, he actually um, took, he went into GE right after Jack Welsh. Um, so it's a very, uh, it's an excellent book. So really, really great. That's wonderful. If you were to go back and change one thing, uh, what would you change in your journey? Leave a little more in myself and believe that I could figure things out, <laughs> especially on those days when I was nervous that I couldn't. More than one word. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. And if you were to have one superpower, uh, what would it be? Tenacity. That is a superpower, isn't it? Most of us, we need it. <laughs> exactly. This this is wonderful, Kara. I still cannot thank you enough for being on my show. This is Thanks. really the highlight of my podcast. I've done about 28 episodes still now. And this is the best one so far. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. And check in with me. I'm all over social at Kara Golden with an I. And I would love to hear from you. Absolutely. And you've, you've given all our audience the spirit of undauntedness that they really need, especially during the pandemic. People need more of such messages. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of the week.